no tillage, probably is the oldest type of agriculture known for humankind. Originally, probably what happened is they would just stick a hole, uh, put a hole in the ground, put the seed, cover up the seed, and whatever grew, grew. But uh, early on in humankind's history, they uh, observed that some sort of tillage was good. And so very early on, agriculture and tillage became synonymous. And this is a, a little uh, picture that's on the cover of the soil, uh, soil and Tillage Research Journal, uh, showing a, a picture from the uh, from from those uh, pyramids. That's the word I'm trying to from Egypt, showing that even back then, tillage and agriculture were synonymous. synonymous. This is two oxen pulling a plow. In 1940s, a man named Edward Faulkner wrote the book called Plowman's Folly. And uh, he had in the very first page of that book a very provocative statement that said, no university professor has ever put forth a good reason why we should plow to grow a crop. And you can imagine that was pretty provocative back then at that time. And. Uh, at the 100th year anniversary, Dr. Triplett and I wrote this article that was part of the 100th year anniversary of the Agronomy Journal. And there was an old folk saying in Ohio that said, plow deep and you will have corn to sell and to keep. And so it was like you had to plow, you had to till to make a corn crop in Ohio and, and across the Midwest. It, there was just no other way. Well. When you do too much tillage, one of the problems is erosion. And you can see on the left a, a field where we've had a, a bare soil and the rainfall comes and a field on the right where no tillage has been practiced. The soil is covered, protects the soil from the raindrop impact. And so uh, you have much less runoff, much less soil erosion. And so that was the probably the greatest uh, thing that drove the, de the development and adaptation of no-tillage. And this is from the site that you'll see tomorrow morning. This was taken in 2002. We had a 40th year uh, picture at that time. And where the corn is a little bit taller, I don't have a uh, pointer, is the no-till plots. Where the corn is a little shorter where we, is where we plowed. You might see some differences tomorrow across the plots. You can see it a little bit. Even though it's been very dry, our corn looks pretty good out there. But you also see two pictures here, uh, Dr. Glover Triplett on the left. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of no-tillage. Uh, he retired here in 1984 and went to Mississippi State and pioneered no-till cotton. And so he has had a huge impact on agriculture across the United States and really around the world. And the other gentleman there on the right is Dr. Dave Van Dorn, a soil physicist. They work together. And I'm very pleased he, he's Retired, he lives here near in the town of Lodi. And I invited him, so I want you to recognize Dr. Dave Van Dorn this morning. He's okay. So his original question was, how much tillage do you really need to grow a crop? Fifty years later, we still have the, the plots out there. We're asking different questions. How much carbon can you sequester, for example, in a, in a no-till field? But that foresight, I think, has been very, very valuable, and we appreciate uh, people like Dave Van Dorn and, and Glover Triplett. So you'll see uh, in 2004, uh, we had a uh, dedication of these plots to Dr. Triplett and Dave Van Dorn. You'll see the sign out there tomorrow. Uh, we have an endowment now for these plots so we can continue to keep these going because there's always pressure on long-term plots to kill them. You know, the administrators say, you know, are you really making money off these plots? Are you getting enough research grants for those? So we have an endowment and we can keep them going. We have four sites. Actually, uh, he mentioned only two are going. Worcester and Hoytville are very synonymous types of experiment where we have both rotation and tillage as part of the, the experiment. We also have at Western where we only have continuous corn. There's not a rotation. And then in Coshocton, we have a long-term no tillage watershed. Again, no rotation, but continuous corn every year. Uh, adaptation of no tillage has been quite strong. It, it was very slow until about 1990. It really took off. 
Uh, Purdue, uh, the, the No Tillage Conservation Center was doing surveys up until about 2002, and they stopped about that time. It has leveled off somewhat, but I think it's still continuing, the adaptation uh, and use of no tillage. But certainly, if not no tillage, conservation tillage is widespread, almost universal across the Corn Belt. Although there are some states, some places where uh, inversion plowing is still common. You can see the bullseye where most of the no tillage is taking place, right in the in the Corn Belt region. Uh, the main crops, and this is a little old because it's 2002 data, but the main crops are soybean. Soybeans work very well for no tillage. Corn is second, and you'll see that uh, in a corn soybean rotation, if you're only no tilling 20% of the corn and 40, it's probably more than 40, 50% of the soybeans now no tillage. That means that we're not doing continuous no till on our soils. And I think that's a, that's a problem in many areas. The benefits of no tillage we're not capturing because about every other year when the soybean crop comes, we're tilling the soil. I mean, when the corn crop comes, we're tilling the soil. There are problems associated with no tillage and, uh, you know, wetter, colder temperatures in the spring are one of them. Sometimes reduced seed germination, increased levels of diseases and pests. Uh, poor performance of planting equipment was one of the major problems early on. I don't think that's quite as much of a problem today. The manufacturing, equipment manufacturers have done a great job in developing new equipment that performs much better under no tillage conditions. The benefits, of course, are, I put this one on top, it doesn't mean it's number one, but increased biological wildlife activity, reduced release of carbon gases, more efficient farm operations, Improved soil water conditions, reduced soil erosion, moderate, moderates the soil temperatures because of that residue cover, decreased compaction, improved nutrient use, and in many cases, improved crop yields. In Worcester, Ohio here, our crop yields are about 17 to 18 bushel per acre, uh, improved by no tillage compared to when we plow on the long-term basis. This shows uh, crop yields, the interaction of tillage and rotation. On the left is the Worcester sites. And so you can see the continuous corn, corn soybean rotation, corn oats hay rotation. All three of those rotations do much better under no-till than under plow till on the silty clay loam soil. At Hoytville, where it's a heavier clay soil, if you don't rotate crops, you do the continuous corn every year, the yellow, you see there's no benefit or maybe even a slight decrease associated with no tillage. But when you rotate corn with another crop, you begin to get some benefit uh, of that no tillage system. And this just shows uh, over the long term period, the yields keep going up because of better fertilizer and crop uh, hybrids, corn hybrids. And the difference between the no-till and plow-till, even on this soil that normally doesn't respond too well uh, to no-tillage at the Hoytville site, you can see that spread has become slightly greater over time uh, as we continue these long-term experiments. What about organic carbon sequestration? Uh, we take about every 10 years uh, uh, Soil sample from the surface, initially we did down to about 30 centimeters. We've gone a little deeper, more recent times. In 1980, you'll see the organic carbon changes. No-till versus plow-till, you had that classic turnover. So were you really sequestering carbon because you're building it at the surface, losing it below the surface? But as we continue doing no-tillage, what happens is that positive effect of building soil organic matter increases from the surface and begins to move farther and farther down into the profile. And so you see in 1996, for example, after 32 years, that benefit of carbon in the soil uh, was all the way down to 45 centimeters. I had a PhD student from us, uh, Argentina do a, a study looking at what soil changes were actually taking place. I worked with Neil Smek, who's a pedologist, uh, soil uh, development specialist. We dug some pits at the edge of the plots and in a forested area nearby and in the grassed area nearby. 
And one of the really amazing things is where we've done long-term no-tillage, and I haven't published this yet, we have to get it out, but where we do the long-term no-tillage, we're actually getting some soil horizon development. You normally think of that like out in a prairie field or under a forest, but where we're doing continuous no-till for 50 years, horizon development is beginning to occur. But this shows the organic carbon differences with time at the Worcester site, the woods, uh, nearby woods that have never been tilled, they have been cut but never tilled. You can see about 40 grams per kilogram at the surface and then goes down pretty quickly as you get into the deeper horizons. Uh, we lose some of that carbon. All of our soils are alpha sols that have developed under forest. This is in the grassy area. It had been tilled but it's been grass for a long time. You see that the top has not reached to that 40. It's a little bit less but there's still quite a bit of carbon there probably as much or more than in the natural soil, forest soil. But look at the difference that tillage makes and then no tillage. The plow tillage, remember it went all the way to 40 at the unit on the top, organic carbon grams per kilogram, we're all the way down to about 12, 13. You can see the plow layer and then below the plow layer, it really drops off significantly to very similar to the forest profile. On the right is the no-till soil profile. We're almost back to what it was under the natural forest, and it decreases rather uh, less dramatically. It does decrease. It doesn't hold quite as much in that plow layer. The other thing you'll see in that profile is you'll see some streaks where macropores, earthworm channels, root channels, cracks are there, which really allows much more water to infiltrate and, and more water to be stored in that system. This is just in the top two inches, uh, which is where the uh, carbon storage is really magnified. Uh, you can see the difference between the no-tillage and the plow-tillage corn between 1962 and 1998. And we do have some more recent data that we're working on right now. Uh, this is Hoytville. And this is organic carbon by tillage and rotation. You'll see the no-till continuous corn versus uh, plow tillage or con uh, conventional tillage continuous corn on the left. We lose about half of our carbon just by tilling. And this is very common across uh, areas where they do these types of long-term studies. And then where you look at where you rotate with soybeans because soybeans produce less residue, less carbon input, you're also losing carbon just by that type of rotation. The no-tillage, of course, tends to maintain a little bit higher level of carbon even with that soybean in the rotation. These are the carbon stocks that uh, we calculated based on those uh, uh, soil profile pits that we dug. In the woods, we had 6.72 megagrams per hectare. The grass had a little bit higher, but the no-till was right there maintaining or, or at least uh, maybe even recovering some of what had been lost prior to the establishment of the no-till plots. And the plow-till plots had the less, least amount of total carbon stored in those fields. And this just shows, this is, uh, you can look at this later to think about, this is kind of a conceptual idea. Where we are is actual. That's the amount of actual carbon in a field at any one time. How can we move that from actual to something that's more easily attainable by controlling erosion, by reducing tillage, by making sure we maintain the residu residues on the soil? We can go from actual to what I'm calling attainable. And then when we go from attainable, what would be the maximum potential? Of course, that has to do also with where you are in the landscape, what type of climate, uh, in weather patterns you have, the soil texture, whether it's clay, sand, uh, but just this movement of actual to attainable to potential uh, carbon storage in the soil. And then lastly, related to water, uh, I've got, I took this from uh, Sword Diker, his uh, no-till systems uh, publication and runoff, and also I've used some of this from Koshokton. But one of the big benefits of no-tillage, it allows the water to move into the soil profile instead of running off and then stored where it can be used during the dry periods of the summer. Uh, this shows average runoff and no-till as percentage of conventional tillage in different states. Uh, number of years, 56% less runoff under, uh, 
and there are no tillage in these systems at the top, Iowa, Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, North Carolina, Alabama, 67% less runoff in these other states. A lot of that has to do with these natural plows, which we call earthworms, uh, introducing uh, pores and ways for the water to get into the soil. And I think one of the best studies looking at the effects of tillage on water uh, infiltration and just hydraulics has been done at the Coshocton site, the hydrologic site, which unfortunately has been closed uh, just this year. But this was a study that was going on when I first started here at Ohio State University. Over four years, the total rainfall varied from 35 to 46 inches. The runoff is measured at the outlet of these small one, two acre watersheds. You can see where it was plowed. The total runoff in inches ranged from 4.46 to 12.47 inches. The total amount of water runoff from the no-till plots was from zero to 0.19 inch. That is very highly significant, very huge difference. And of course, if you don't have runoff, you don't have erosion. And so if you look at the erosion, the amount of uh, soil lost under the mobile plow situation, uh, 436 was a rather good year for the moldboard plow, up to 8,455 pounds per acre. And uh, under no tillage, it was 0 to 15. Uh, so a big difference there. Development of macro pores, uh, this is at 30 centimeter depth. You can see all the different pores there. One last thing, uh, when you, one of the disadvantages of no tillage, all those macro pores, when you have them directly over a tile line, the worms like to go from the surface directly to the tile line. I don't, there's something about the tile line, it's wet there, they like to live there. And so Martin Shipatello has done some work on this and he's used uh, acrylic material to, to trace these earthworms from the tile drain to the surface. He's attached a, a, a fan and put a smoke bomb in these tile drains and you can see the smoke coming out of all those macro pores right over the tile drain. A uh, very dramatic illustration. So what can we do to maintain the benefits of no tillage but circumvent some of these types of things? Because when you get this direct drainage to the tile drain, you're moving nitrates and other types of nutrients. Maybe one way is just to till over that tile line. Uh, there's other things people are trying. Thank you.